in the digital age that we live in, uh, precision, accuracy, granularity is important. And clinical medicine is more challenging than ever. There are more therapies that help patients, but this therapy is based on information that comes from data. So we really have to do a good job converting data into information, and that's what Heart Model does. And you may think of LV function 10, 20, 30 years in terms of the historic literature as well. It's just a number, another number that we get on an exam. I hope after you uh, see my talk that you'll understand why LV function is more than a number. It's really a guidepost that walks you through the therapy of the patient. So to kick it off, uh, what I'll be talking today really is about global LV function. So regional is for another time. And uh, essentially, heart failure is the end stage for just about every type of uh, cardiac disease. And there's a long list that you can see here on, on the lower right. Uh, the important ones and the ones that, that come across commonly clinically in the adult, and again, I'll be speaking in the context of adults today with uh, normally formed hearts, uh, we deal with ischemia, ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, whether they be large or small reductions in LV function, size and, and ejection fraction. Uh, Chemotherapy-induced changes in the heart, which essentially induces a mild or can induce a severe form of heart failure. And something we don't necessarily connect, but it turns out that structural heart disease and valve dysfunction, for example, mitral regurgitation, can cause changes in LV function. So just about anything that you order on an echo exam, it comes back to understanding what is the size uh, and the ejection of the, uh, the left ventricle. You notice that the recommendations call into account, and here comes here come two pearls for you. Uh, what are the what are two at least two problems with 2D echo and looking at LV volume? And problem number one is for shortening. Problem number two is making assumptions about geometric shape. And when you actually work with experts, you find out that foreshortening the ventricle um, is much more common than people give it credit for, and it's much more common, especially for new, new users, uh, physicians and sonographers first uh, starting out in their career. So nonetheless, 2D echo, while it's important and has been used for decades, actually is fraught with these two um, challenges. Yet I just told you that therapy really needs an accurate guide to quantification. In fact, think beyond ischemic heart disease. Uh, if we look at the guidelines, these are uh, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines on management of patients with uh, valve disease. If we look at the guidelines for uh, aortic insufficiency, aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, uh, LV volume and EF are smack in the middle of that. What you see there is basically a patient uh, pathway. Basically, these guidelines are defining what is the optimum way based on medical evidence to care for a patient depending on what their state of cardiac function is. So if you see now, I'm painting a picture more than, well, this is, just, this is just a number and we have to report the number. No, this number actually defines where you are on these care pathways. And even more than left ventricular function, because we think about LV for so many years, it turns out that the LA is a very important chamber as well. Uh, and actually, Dr. Tsang and I talk about diastolic function and a very important uh, marker of uh, ventricular um, robustness, ventricular function, uh, comes from markers of LA quantification. It turns out the literature shows definitively that the LA size is an important determinant of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And it's actually very commonly used uh, in echo labs that uh, keep themselves abreast of the latest literature. And you can see here a whole host of uh, bibliography uh, journal entries corroborating the use of LA size as an important marker for patient outcome. So we're really painting a picture here of something very, very important for the clinician and even more important, not just for the sonographer and for the echocardiographer or uh, echo physician, but frankly for the referring physician, the surgeons, the interventionalist, and most importantly, the patient. What's emerged uh, into this horizon over the past few years is chemotherapy. And one of the common uh, chemotherapeutic agents that's used uh, is a family of agents called anthracyclines. There's some other agents. And what they do, actually, is they uh, poison the heart. But the use of um, uh, high-precision echo, both in speckle tracking and LV volume detection, has shown that, uh, actually, the heart gets poisoned at the first drop of chemotherapy. And different patients respond differently to that. 
So in fact, you can see here, even early in months in cancer therapy, there's a decrease in contractile function. Depending on how that chemotherapy dose is modulated, there can be return of contractile function. But over time, various cardiac stresses, oxidative stresses, repeat chemotherapy can actually cause a decline in LV function. And it's very, very important to measure this uh, uh, LV function, not only in terms of strain, which you hear a lot uh, of uh, papers talk about, but it turns out that understanding volume as a marker for left ventricular remodeling is very important in chemotherapy. So now I've painted you a picture of the challenges that clinicians face. It's not simply about a number, um, but basically they're taking care of patients who have heart attacks, patients who have leaky valves, patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, basically patients who have uh, decreased LV function and, and increases in LA size of all causes. From a Philips healthcare perspective, outside of ultrasound, anatomic intelligence uh, comprises a few components. It's multimodality, so it, can wor it works with CT and MR. In fact, that technology originally came from CT and MR. Um, and it works from the 3D aspects of that multimodality imaging. Essentially, knowledge is generated by looking at a multitude of uh, imaging modalities of an organ, and that knowledge is amassed into a database, and then a very specific adaptive system intelligence, uh, proprietary Philips intelligence, is used to actually run anatomic intelligence. The generic model actually then from, from its uh, multimodality heart model incarnation, be it ultrasound, CT, MRI, actually was specifically adapted for ultrasound data sets, which is what you can see below. And in the machine, when you run heart model today, there are actually two components uh, in the algorithm that actually allow heart model to do its thing. The first is knowledge-based identification. It actually looks at what is the orientation or the lie of the heart in the imaging plane, and it actually orients the heart, understanding if it's uh, large, dilated, tilted, banana-shaped, and so forth. And then it goes through a second stage, which is patient-specific adaptation. So then it really localizes the local nooks and crannies of the heart uh, for that specific patient so that actually you get the best possible fit. So those are the two components, uh, and you'll hear more about that later. In case you forgot, heart model is fast, easy, and reproducible. So let's, let's understand what this means uh, a little bit more in detail as I go through the remainder of my talk. As one of the engineers who uh, worked on this likes to say, uh, heart model actually has its value and its resilience because it's built on the pyramid of power. So only Philips actually has the portfolio of anatomic intelligence technology, insight imaging, and pure wave X matrix transducer technology. Uh, frankly, uh, to be to be very um, simple about it, heart model and anatomic intelligence doesn't work without the best possible image quality. It's because of pure wave and X matrix that you get the exquisite 3D image quality that you can uh, in, in an ultrasound transducer, and it's end site imaging technology that really brings all that signal out from the transducer. So with the best possible 3D images, uh, you create the foundation for which heart model uh, operates. And this is actually very important because anatomic intelligence depends on the whole package. Uh, it's important for you to realize it's this whole portfolio, this pyramid of power, uh, that's actually very important. So what are the benefits to the physician? Accurate and scientifically studied quantification. So I'll mention what accuracy is very soon, but I want you to ask yourself in the next few moments how you define accuracy and what accuracy means to you. Uh, the other benefits are less key clicks. Because of the automation, there's no orientation needed. That's because of the knowledge-based identification. Uh, actually, heart model does its thing to actually streamline and make quantification very easy. In fact, it doesn't just make it easy, it makes it fast, because as you can see in the video, it just takes seconds. Uh, and in fact, uh, to get a whole view and all of the views of the heart in multiple planes, uh, you actually can't get all of those planes in seconds the way you can from a single, the way you can from a single 3D uh, acquisition. And you get automated views, as you can see here below. So you don't have to worry about the intimidating, cutting, cropping, and slicing because uh, the machine actually knows about a heart. It's, it's uh, facial recognition, or in this case, cardiac recognition of the ultrasound machine. The ultrasound machine actually understands what it's looking at. 
And so that helps you get better agreement, it gives you smaller bias, and it gives you lower scatter. So I've teed up a lot of words here, accuracy, bias, agreement, variability. Uh, let's talk about what that means. Let's talk about precision, because that's probably a little bit easier concept to start off with. Uh, if, if you look at the X's, you can see in the top half of the image, the X's are all close to each other. When the X's are close to each other, we say that there's low variability, um, that there's low scatter, that actually the numbers are precise. And it turns out with heart model, uh, editing aside, uh, if you push, if you push the button, so in other words, if Lynn pushes the button, I push the button, Rob pushes the button, they're gonna get the same answer as if, uh, the world famous luminary pushes the button or someone who's never used it before, uh, and that's, that's why heart model is, is quite precise. And so that's very important. Now, it turns out that besides variability, what's important is accuracy. And accuracy is defined as where the average of all those little X's are. So if we have a gold standard, for example, a gold standard could be MRI, a gold standard could be expert 3D tracings, uh, we want that gold standard or that yellow center in the bullseye uh, to define what, what, uh, what accuracy is. So obviously the ideal is the upper left because it's accurate and it has low variability. This is kind of a counterintuitive concept, so I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. But the image on the, uh, on the bottom left there, actually, while it's imprecise and has wide scatter, is actually accurate because if you take the average of the measurements, you fall in the, in the bullseye. It turns out clinicians, if they have to uh, settle for either bias, which is on the upper right, a little bit of shift, uh, where that, that blue star is not quite in the bullseye, and that's, that's actually bias, Clinicians would actually prefer reductions in uh, variability uh, and tolerate a little bit of bias as long as that bias is not too great. And that's what's really important. If you think about it and we want to look at a chemotherapy patient and we want to look at that chemotherapy patient over time, we really don't want a lot of variability in the measurement. We really want that, that variability to be low, that scatter to be low, that standard deviation to be low, that measurement to be precise. And so it turns out that that's why heart model is beneficial because it's precise and it ha it's reproducible and it has low variability. And as I'll show you, it actually is accurate because we've done validations against studies. So the benefits to the physician then, if we kind of start to tie all these pieces together and bring all these pieces together, this is uh, an EA, ASC, or EACVI uh, guideline on 3D echo. And you can see on the lower right there the two uh, nemesis of 2D echo, which are ne uh, uh, foreshortening and geometric assumptions. Well, the benefits of 3D quantification are no, no foreshortening, no, uh, no geometric assumptions. And in fact, fast and easy. So this is the holy grail. So basically what you're learning about today, uh, and I make uh, no reservations about it, is you're looking at the holy grail of 3D quantification for the left ventricle and the left atrium. The good news is that heart model is flexible. You can define for your lab where you want heart model to define the border. Goes without saying, and you'll, and you'll see examples of the regional editing, which is simple and easy to use. And again, the automated views give you a very intuitive visualization of 3D, uh, 3D uh, views. So now let's, let's go into the, uh, the reasons to believe. So I've talked to you about accuracy. Accuracy is the agreement with the standard. And actually we have two abstracts which were presented at American College of Cardiology. We actually have a pretty large paper. Dr. Tsang, Dr. Lang, and I and others actually collaborated. Uh, we have a, we have a paper, uh, in the referee process now. When I have the, when we have a letter of acceptance, we'll obviously share with you the letter of acceptance, but we're eagerly awaiting that referee, uh, process. But we're gonna have studies which demonstrate the accuracy compared to a standard. The other thing, though, that we did is we looked at some uh, uh, speed studies. And so it turns out that uh, in this particular cohort, we had an N of 30. Um, this was done at University of Chicago. It turns out that when you do LV and LA uh, quantification with heart model, actually you can have a significant reduction uh, in time. And let me go into that in a little bit detail. It turns out that... Uh, there is an 82% reduction if uh, editing aside with heart model. And even if you do editing, there's a 63% reduction uh, in the speed with which you can do this. So think about it. We've got accurate 
and we've got reproducible quantification. Reproducible is the same as precise. Uh, and interestingly, when you, when you do that, you have it not only in 3D, but you actually have it faster than 2D. So you can actually have your cake and eat it too, as they say uh, in America. So you can have your, your great quantification by 3D, and you can do it more quickly at the same time. And actually, if you do a little scenario here, and you have an exam uh, in a lab uh, that, uh, you have 50 exams in a lab that have a pretty uh, significant throughput per day, at three to six times faster, you can actually save a, a, a huge amount of time. So if it takes you three hours by conventional quantification, even with editing, you're down to an hour or even half an hour if you have minim minimal editing. And the global, uh, e global tools can actually help you get to that uh, point where you're actually doing minimal editing. So huge reductions in time here. So this is actually, again, why this is a dramatic benefit of heart model. So what we worked on and we worked very hard on was to make heart model robust. We worked very significantly behind the scenes, both in the clinical trials and in the creation of the technology to make it robust. And this is what robust means. Robust means it's like that mountain bike there on the lower right. Um, sure, it works on pavement, but it works on the mud. It works under dry conditions. It works in wet condition, wet conditions. So heart model runs on many, many types of patients and many, many types of pathology. So that's what we mean by not only reproducible, but robustly reproducible. And if we actually take it into the clinical realm, this is what we, this is what we mean. Hearts come in different sizes and shapes. And what we spent a lot of time, and actually what I believe Philips has a lot of insight over the competitors on, is actually understanding uh, what robust means uh, from a technology viewpoint. Because heart model actually runs on normal shapes, of course, but it actually runs on dilated hearts, hearts with banana shapes, sigmoid septum. And so this capability actually allows it to be used in a wide spectrum in a wide setting. So to summarize for you, uh, essentially what heart model is all about is using the benefits of 3D quantification, uh, but doing it with more patients and less time uh, and satisfying the higher demand on quality. Uh, LV function is critical, as is LA function, in assessing ischemia, cardiomyopathy, valvular disease, uh, and many conditions. And Philips anatomic intelligence technology and heart model in particular is fast, easy, robustly reproducible. And uh, you will be seeing scientific uh, proof of accuracy, which has already been published and which is coming. Innovation and you. Philips.